What's going on YouTube? It's uh, May 25th, um, Thursday afternoon, watching CNN here, and uh, all of this just popped up out of the blue. Um, I got it on DVR, so I'm just going to let it play through. The uh, interview is actually not even complete yet, but I just wanted to uh, show you guys. They're talking about Class 2, Class 3 weapons, and uh, the loophole, the supposed loophole of uh, getting a trust. Um, so I just wanted to, uh, I'm going to let this play through and then I'll let you guys decide uh, what do you think about this interview um, as far as gun rights are concerned. So um, I'm going to start the video here and uh, I'm going to let you guys uh, listen to this interview. I'm going to turn it up so that the uh, microphone picks up the sound on the camera. Um, so just bear with me and uh, here we go and grenades are not your typical weapons. These are considered Title II weapons, and for each Title II purchase, a person must submit photos and fingerprints to federal authorities for a background check. Even if those checks come back clear, a local official like a sheriff or a district attorney gets to weigh in on the purchase. So even after passing the initial check, the purchase can still be denied. However, there is a way around this. If you set up a certain type of trust, you can avoid the normal precautions like a background check and get your weapon. Jeff Folliter is the executive director of the National Firearms Act Trade and Collectors Association. J. Tom Morgan is the former district attorney for DeKalb County here in Georgia. Uh, thank you both for coming on to chat about this. Jeff, I want to start with you. Uh, tell me why sure. these trusts can be a good idea, as you said. Well, there's several reasons that trusts and corporations are used in the uh, purchase of NFA weapons or Title II weapons. Most of that is to provide for things like probate issues and transfer of the weapons in the event that a succession issue takes place. So you have no problem then, Jeff, with the trust themselves? I mean, what, what about the lack of a background check that comes along with, with setting up one of these and going about, going about it this way to get your, your firearm? Well, it is a bit troubling. Um, I'd like to actually point out that the chief law enforcement officers uh, that you talked about earlier do not have the ability to either approve or reject an application. They have the ability to either sign or not sign the application. Once they've signed the application to purchase one of these weapons, it is then that the background check occurs with the FBI. And interestingly enough, when a chief law enforcement officer chooses to not sign the application for this weapon, what winds up happening is, is that people go ahead and set up a trust, and the net effect of it is a background check never takes place because the chief law enforcement officer didn't sign the form. Got it. Uh, Jay Tom, I want to bring you in. You were a DA, and it was your job to review the applications for Title II weapons. Did you approve any? And, and if so, what was the circumstance? Randy, only once in 12 years did I ever make such an approval. That was a rare circumstance where a business owner had large sums of cash every evening that he needed to get three blocks to the bank. So I approved the purchase of this uh, Title II weapon. Uh, our audience needs to understand we're not talking about shotguns and deer rifles here. We're talking about large caliber, uh, high powerful automatic and semi-automatic weapons, uh, which we need checks and balances on. Yeah, from what I read, this includes uh, rockets and silencers and all kinds of stuff. Uh, Jay, Tom, if you were in an urban market, you know, at Atlanta, would you have ruled differently, do you think, if you were in, say, Idaho or Montana? Well, that's one of the problems. In an urban area, I have a constituency to protect, and I had no qualms about denying and not signing off on these applications. Also, I disagree. I think very few people are going to hire a lawyer and go to the trouble of getting a trust if you deny signing these applications. Uh, in some areas, though, the prosecutor would be under a lot of pressure to sign these applications, and which is why we need uniformity nationwide and not on a prosecutor or sheriff-by-sheriff -sheriff basis. And Jeff, there, there are so many local law enforcement officers around the country with the power to veto purchases. Uh, you get so many different opinions. Do you think there should be one uniform federal standard? Well, it's, it's interesting. Again, uh, you just said that the sheriff or the chief law enforcement officer has the power to veto this purchase. There is no power of the sheriff to veto the purchase. In 1934, the National Firearms Act was put into law and the only uh, situation that was given to the chief law enforcement officers 
was to offer information if they had it available that that user or that purchaser shouldn't own the weapon. Okay, In but should there be a age, uniform federal standard, do you think? But there is. Right now, if that form is signed, a uniform federal investigation conducted by the FBI is conducted on that purchaser and it comes back either approved or not approved, depending upon what the FBI finds out. And that includes whether or not the weapon is legal for owner ownership in a given locality or state. Jay, Tom, you want to weigh in here? Uh, again, we're talking about semantics here. You cannot get that weapon unless the chief law enforcement officer or prosecutor signs off on it. That's why we need a uniform standard, Randy. And what is your greatest concern, Jay Tom? I mean, if these weapons are out there, what what is your greatest fear that could happen? Now, these weapons get in the hands of persons that, such as terrorists, such as gang leaders, drug dealers. Uh, these, as I said, are not the type of weapons that most persons in our society or or the person defending their so home. If anyone has one of these, we need to know who they are, where they are and what they're doing with these weapons. All right, Jay, Tom, Jeff, we will leave it there. Thank you both for weighing in. Thank you. Well, so basically you're getting uh, two type of arguments. The gentleman um, on the left of the screen with the mustache is what I'm looking at. Um, he is uh, for the, um, the, the way things are now, while the uh, former prosecutor on the right um, want some uh, uniform in, in how you go about purchasing uh, class 3 or title 2 weapons um, there should be I guess his his belief is, is this loophole of, of being able to set up a trust in order to get uh, for instance uh, an SBR or a short barreled rifle um, a rifle with a barrel shorted in 6 inches with uh, some type of uh, shoulder buttstock um, he believes that you know you should have to go through some sort of federal, uh, uh, I guess some federal drawing, or that's the best way I can put it, or some fill out some sort of federal form and go through uh, severe background checks in order to um, purchase a Class Three weapon. Uh, the gentleman with the mustache believes that it, as far as it goes, it's it's okay. Um, it is uniform the way it is, and that you have to set up a trust. Um, and the way you set up a trust, you still get checked. I mean, but they're also saying that you, there's no background check if you set up a trust. Um, you know, I don't want to get give out too too much information, but I know someone who's in the process of doing that, um, and they've gone through all the legal straits and 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 done everything that you um, need to do in order to uh, get an SBR. Uh, the legal way uh, and and one way you can do it is by setting up a trust um, a civilian can do it but this is more for uh, businesses this is a way for businesses to get class 3 NFA weapons um, so um, just leave your comments below um, I really don't know what to think I don't I don't really see any um, any bias in the video but uh, I would like to know what you guys think on this because you're 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 getting two sides of the story on here. There's usually uh two si there's usually three sides to every story. So we don't know what's going on in the background, what's going to happen um, later on down the road when it comes to this type of uh, uh, ownership of a firearm. Um, it may become illegal altogether at some point in time, where you just can't get a class three weapon. You can't get an SBR. Um, and it may be that at some point in time you don't need to set up a trust you don't need to ask your uh, local uh, uh, law officials to to do such a thing you might just be able to go out and purchase one so we don't know but uh, just you know leave your comments below let me know how you guys feel about um, this interview with these two gentlemen um, and I guess we'll you know I'll set up some sort of discussion or something like that in the comments just to see what people think all right, peace.